1963 and 64, the main struggles were for des desegregation and voting rights. Today, our struggle is to rebuild communities and cities. What we need to do now is begin engaging our children in community building activities with the same audacity with which the civil rights movement engaged them in desegregation and voter registration activities 35 years ago. Classes of school children from K to 12 should be taking responsibility for maintaining neighborhood streets, planting community gardens, recycling waste, rehabbing houses, creating healthier school lunches, visiting and doing errands for the elderly, organizing neighborhood health festivals, painting public murals. The possibilities are endless. This is the fastest way to motivate all our children to learn and at the same time reverse the physical deterioration of our neighborhood. This is a wonderful way to nurture the desire of children to be of service and provide opportunities for, different, for children with different talents to make a difference and win the respect of their peers and elders. By giving children a better reason, a reason to study than just to get a job or to advance their individual upward mobility, it will also get their cartridge juices flowing. Learning from practice, learning will come from practice, which has always been the best way to learn. And just imagine how much safer and livelier our neighborhoods we would become almost overnight. One of the most exciting aspects of our work is the synergy that has developed between the community and the university. As I witness and participate in this excitement and contrast our visionary efforts to rebuild Detroit with the multi-billion mega projects of politicians and developers that involve casinos, giant stadia, gentrification, and the 2006 Super Bowl. I am saddened by their short-sightedness. I rejoice at the energy that is being unleashed in our communities by our human scale programs that involve bringing the country back into the city and removing the walls between schools and communities, between generations and between ethnic groups. And I am confident that just as in the early 20th century, people came from around the world to marvel at the mass production lines produced by Henry Ford. In the 21st century, they will be coming to marvel at the thriving neighborhoods that are the fruit of our visionary programs. Some of these part, persistence of these programs are here today. Will you please stand up? They'll be in the Henderson room after the meeting, and you can talk. That's what revolution is about. It's about creating a new society in the places and spaces left vacant by the disintegration of the old. About evolving to a higher humanity, not to higher buildings. About love of one another and of the earth, not hate. About hope, not despair. By saying yes to life, and no to war, about becoming the change we want to see in the world. My sense is that this same process is taking place at the grassroots level and other places around the world. I think of the women in the village in India who sparked the Chipko movement by hugging the trees to keep them be from being cut down by private contractors. And I feel our kinship with the Zapatistas in Chiapas who announced to the world on January 1st, 1994 that their development was going to be grounded in their own culture and not stunted by NAFTA free market. We live in exciting times. We are building on the legacy of Gandhi and King, which in this period requires that we redefine our relation to the earth and to each other. We invite you to join us, support us, replicate us in your own community. That is how communities are, uh, movements are created. Something that people do in one place seems so right and just. For example, the sit down of the, of the auto workers in Flint in 1937, or the sit in of the black students at the Greensboro, North Carolina, Woolsworth in 1960, that people in other places say, we can do that. 
and the movement takes off. That is how I hope you will respond to what we are doing in Detroit. Thank you.